we're done our interest rate swap, let's have a look at the other big swap in this chapter, the currency swap. And let's set up our scenario. It's February 11th, 2011, and we have two companies, IBM in the U.S. and British Petroleum in, uh, in the U.K. And IBM wants access to sterling, uh, 10, million, uh, 10 million pounds. BP, on the other hand, wants access to U.S. dollars, wants 18 million. Now, they could solve their own problem. BP could borrow in U.S. dollars, but would be borrowing in the U.S. and paying perhaps a higher rate of interest than it would pay if it borrowed sterling. And the U.S. could do the same thing, could borrow in the U.K. market and, and, and raise sterling, but might pay a higher interest rate in the U.K. than it would pay if it borrowed domestically. The other way of solving the problem is IBM and BP can both borrow domestically and convert their currencies into the foreign currency, but that opens up forex uh, uh, exchange risk five years later when they decide that they want to uh, bring those dollars and pounds back home. Well, they're at the will of the exchange rate. So they can get together and do this. IBM will borrow in its own market, will borrow 18 million and maybe get 6%, and BP will borrow in its own market uh, 10 million pounds and perhaps gets 5%. And we see that the exchange rate at that time, and this is a spot rate, uh, and it's uh, all rates uh, are quoted as pairs, uh, one pair dot another pair, and this is the pound dot US. And how it's read is we always assign the value of one to the first of the pair. So we read it this way, one British pound buys $1.80 US. So it's just read that way. Whatever the first of the pair is, is one buys so much of this. If we needed to quote it the other way, if we wanted to quote it as the US dollar, great British pound, it would be one divided by 1.80, and whatever that equals, so that it would be one US dollar buys, and we could see this will be less than, 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 than one dollar. Uh, it might be 60 cents or 50 cents, uh, whatever the case is, uh, in British pounds. So, a little quick lesson on how to read a spot rate, but that's uh, the spot rate is 1.8. So, if we had 10 million pounds, if each one pound is $1.80 uh, $1 US, 10 million must be 18 million. So, that equals. So, now what they'll do is Contrary to what happens in an interest rate swap, where they only swap the interest rate payments, on day one, IBM will give to BP the 18 million US dollars, and BP will give to IBM the 10 million pounds. They'll actually swap the principal on day one, on February 11th, and on February 11th, 2016, when it's over, they'll simply reverse that. They'll give it back. They'll give that back. In the meantime, what do we have going on here? Let's look at what the cash flows have to do. BP still has to pay 5% on 10 million pounds in its own market. So IBM will pay that because IBM now has the sterling, has invested the sterling, and is probably generating a sterling return. So it will pay 5% uh, in, in British pounds to BP, and that makes BP whole in its own market. BP wants to make IBM whole in its own market, so it will pay 6% uh, uh, in dollars, in US dollars. It'll pay 6%. That's an important statement I made. To have zero currency risk, the whole idea of the swap is to avoid the currency risk. To have zero currency risk, whatever BP is experiencing in its market as its interest rate, it must be made whole on the swap. Each side must be made whole based on their, their borrowing costs in their market. So the financial institution's got its job cut out for it in this case. So let's have a look at, now that we understand the nature of the swap, let's have a look at what the cash flows look like. And we'll look at it from IBM's, um, um, from IBM's point of view. So on day one, what is, uh, what is IBM going to do? IBM sends $18 million over to BP, and then it's going to pay, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, in US dollars, it's going to receive 6% on that 18 million, 6%. So 6% on that 18 million, it's gonna receive 1.08 million on each of the next five anniversary dates. And on the final date, 
That 18 million comes back to IBM, so it's going to receive 19.08. So five interest payments plus the principal payment, the 18 out and the 18 back. In British pounds, what's going to happen is it's parting with $18 million, but it's receiving 10 million pounds, and these are British pounds. But it has to part with 5% on that 10 million. So it's going to part with five payments. Uh, sorry, that's not a, a positive sign. That's a negative sign. 0 0.5, 0 0.5. That's the third one. The fourth one, and on the last date, it's going to pay back the 10 million pounds plus the final interest payment. So that is how, from IBM's perspective, that's how the cash is going to flow. Notice the important thing here that's different from the interest rate swap. On day one, the principal amount does actually change hands. It changes hands. But on the final day, the principal amount comes back. So as far as, I, uh, as IBM... Uh, uh, paying back these dollars, it will give out dollars and get those same dollars back. Same with BP, it will give out pounds and get those same pounds back. So the currency risk is taken care of there. The interest rate payments that occur during that period of time protect each of BP and IBM in their domestic markets in terms of the interest in their domestic currency that they have to pay. Those are the two big things to be aware of, is the principal at the beginning and the end, and the elimination of any currency risk to the swap. That's the big thing. This is called a fixed for fixed swap. Why is because IBM is paying a fixed rate on pounds and BP is paying a fixed rate on dollars. No currency risk because it avoids, from IBM's perspective, and you could say the same thing for BP, it avoids, number one, IBM borrowing US dollars, number two, converting those US dollars to pounds, and then, number three, converting those pounds back to US five years later. It avoids all of that occurring. So let's have a look at the currency swap in detail as an example, and we'll use the comparative advantage argument again, or as I like to call it, the comparative disadvantage argument. Let's take two companies, an American company, GE, and an Australian company, an airline, Qantas, and we'll look at what they can borrow at in U.S. dollars and in Australian dollars. And we can see that in the U.S., GE can borrow at 5%, Qantas can borrow at 7%. In Australia, where interest rates are higher, uh, GE is facing a 7.6% borrowing cost on Australian dollars, Qantas 8%. So we can see the GE is the better company in both markets. GE can get a bor better borrowing cost in both markets. That's not the point, right? Remember what we did is we looked at the disadvantage Qantas has in both markets. In borrowing US dollars, Qantas is disadvantaged by 2%, whereas in Australia, Qantas is disadvantaged by only 0.4%. So remember, let's call this A, let's call this B, a minus B equals 1.6% or 160 basis points. So there is a possibility of squeezing 100 basis, 160 basis points out of the system. So the financial institution looking at this might say, you know, I can help these two companies and there's plenty of margin in here for me. There's 1.6% that can be split among the two companies and there's a healthy bit of margin in there for me. So what it uh, is going to do is it's going to suggest to GE, GE, why don't you borrow in your own market? And Qantas, why don't you borrow in your own market? So GE is going to borrow 15 million because GE wants 20 million Australian. Qantas wants 15 million US and the exchange rate is 0.75. Remember how we read this, one Australian dollar by 75 cents US. So if we want 20 million Australian dollars and they only buy 75 cents US each, they'll only buy 15 million. So GE will borrow 15 million US at, what can it borrow at? 5%. Qantas, on the other hand, will borrow 20 million Australian and it can borrow at 8%. So the financial institution says, okay, that's what you guys are going to do. And this 15 million dollars, will get sent over to Qantas, and this 20 million will get sent over to GE. You guys just swap the currency. Now, GE, you've got your 20 million, and Qantas, you've got your 15 million.
but we got to handle these borrowing costs. We got to make sure the financial institution has to make it easy for them to want to do business. So he has to structure a deal so that it's easy for them to say yes. If he opens them up to any currency risk, well, then if I am in for a penny, I'm in for a pound, I'll take all the currency risk. So the financial institution recognizes that it must make Qantas whole. It must pay Qantas 8% on the Australian total, and it must pay GE 5% on the US total. Now you've taken all the currency risk out of out of play for both GE and Qantas. All the currency risk is gone. But we need to make some money here. We need to make some money. So what is what it's going to do is going to say uh, 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 okay there's 160 basis points to split uh, which means 80 per side. I can have 80 uh, pips uh, or 80 basis points saved on this side, 80 on this side. Financial institution says, you know what, since I'm doing two things here, I'm bringing the deal together, number one, and I'm handling all currency risk, number two. I want a nice margin. I want 20 basis points, 10 on each side. So he, the financial institution is going to structure a deal so that Qantas is 70 basis points better off and that GE is, is uh, 70 basis points better off. So let's look at what they can do for GE. GE is getting US dollar, Australian dollars. If GE had to borrow that in the Australian market, it would pay 7.6%. So it says, well, how would you like to only pay 6.9%? So that's what they're going to pay. There's your 70 basis points. You'll pay 6.9% AUD. And for Qantas, Qantas could have borrowed in the US market at 7%. So it's going to make it 70 basis points better off and saying, how would you like to only pay 6.3%? So, look at the situation. Qantas has its 15 million US and is going to pay 6.3% financing on that US because it would have paid 7. GE has 20 million Australian dollars and is going to pay 6.9% on Australian instead of 7.6. So, let's see what position that leaves the financial institution in so that we understand that it is making money. So, the financial institution is going to receive 6.3% in US, but it's going to pay out five of that in US, and it's going to receive 6.9% Australian, but it's going to pay out 8% AUD. So 6.3 minus 5, they are going to get 1.3% in US dollars. 6.9 minus 8, they're going to lose 1.1% in Australian dollars. So what does that turn into to see how they can make money? Well, 1.3% in US dollars, keep in mind it's on uh, uh, 15 million US dollars, turns into 195,000 US dollars. But they've got to pay out 1.1 Australian. And 1.1 on 20 million Australian is 220K uh, AUD. So how do we compare the 195 and the 220? Well, we can multiply the 220 by the exchange rate, 0.75, and this comes to 165 USD. So they are bringing in 195, and they are spending 165, which gives them 30K USD per annum. However, this is the exchange rate today. This is for five years. So the financial institution is going to have currency risk for five years. What it can do is it can hedge on day one. It can hedge with forwards. And we're going to see forwards very shortly when we value uh, currency swaps. We're going to see how we arrive at a series of forward rates for the currency. We've already seen it, by the way. We've already seen it in Chapter 4, but we're going to visit it again. So there is the structure of the deal. GE is happy, no currency risk, and is borrowing 70 basis points lower than it could have in Australian dollars. Qantas is happy, no currency risk, and it's borrowing 70 basis points lower than it could in US dollars. The financial institution is happy because it's making a spread of $30,000 uh, US per annum on the two swaps combined.